you know, um, one of the things that I brought back from Cape Town when we were down there for the 412 conference is that when, in terms of building healthy churches, and that's what 412 is about, and actually that's what Living Hope is about, our, our desire is to build healthy churches to do what? Fulfill the Great Commission. That's our, our mission step. You'll see it on the welcome board out there. And the, the word that I came back with, or, or I, the conviction I came back with, is do you know that even one ounce of wasted energy doing something that is not to that purpose is wasting time? Because there's such an urgency in the earth for healthy churches. Yeah, there's such an urgency because... Um, Christianity is so distorted in so many places in the world at the moment. And I really believe that the enemy has an agenda to distort the, the genuine gospel. That, that's one of his current agendas. So the urgency to have healthy New Testament churches that can then help plant and build healthy New Testament churches is the agenda of the kingdom. And it's an urgent agenda. So in order to do that, healthy churches have healthy Christians. And our urgent task is to become healthy so that we then stop focusing on ourselves and start focusing on others and leading others into a healthy relationship with Christ. That's an urgency on us. So this morning, I want to develop some of the things that Mervis was just sharing on because I believe that there is a word in this about how we interact with the Holy Spirit, about us becoming healthier Christians so that we can not only experience more of the power of God in our lives, but also have a community of such power that no one will be able to walk into any of our churches and not experience God's presence. So are you with me this morning? Good. So... I want to talk a little bit about the love language of the Holy Spirit. Now, um, a guy called Gary Chapman, as he put it up there, um, a guy called Gary Chapman wrote a book called The Five Love Languages, and this book has sold over 11 million copies. How many people have heard of this, the book? That, yeah, I see, even in this room, Loads of people know about it. And what it, what it has is it basically has five love languages. Can we put those up? The five love languages and understanding your love language and those you relate to their love language can help your relationship. Understanding how they receive love and give love can help us deepen our relationships. Now, what I must say is I'm not here to sell this book. I'm not here to endorse this book. I'm just talking about the principle of understanding what someone else loves and how they work and how that can enhance your relationship. And actually, to be honest, it can save you money because if their love language is not receiving gifts, like my wife, I don't bother buying her gifts anymore because it's wasted money. <laughs> So how many people here know their love language? Okay, loads. So how many people's love language is words of affirmation? Okay, keep your hands up. You guys are awesome. You're amazing. <laughs> All of you are so great. How many people here have a love language of receiving gifts? Tough. <laughs> And I have to tell you a personal experience, actually, of, of getting this wrong, because before I understood all about my wife's love languages, Carol here is, is my wife, I thought I was going to be awesome husband. I was going to go to the top of the husband charts. So one Christmas, because Carol likes to have her feet rubbed, and yeah, she does. So that's not a love language, I don't think. <laughs> And so I thought, right, I'm going to be husband number one because she's given me a list of all the presents she wants for Christmas, but I'm going to go off-piste. That was the first mistake I made. <laughs> so 
I bought her this really awesome, cool plastic foot spa. And I didn't tell her, and I wrapped it up, and I thought on Christmas Day when she opens this present, I am going to be so in there. And so she says, oh, what's this? And she opens up this present, and as soon as I saw her face, I knew I'd miscalculated. (laughs) It wasn't that she hated it or anything like that, but... It just wasn't pushing her buttons, you know what I mean? Because her love language, her worst love language, is receiving gifts. Now compare that, just to prove that I'm not a totally inept husband, compare that to one morning, it was a work day, standard work day, we woke up, we're both going to work, and uh, when we woke up and the alarm went off, ready to go to work, I turned to her and I said, actually darling, we're not going to work today. Because I phoned your employer and I sorted out with my employer that we're going to have holiday together. And I've booked a retreat. We're going down to Cornwall to spend three days of quality time, just you and me. (laughs) I tell you, for those next two hours, I was top of the husband charts. You know that knowing some, what someone really loves means that you can avoid hurting them. And you can give them pleasure. And you can really deepen your relationship with them. And you know, Mervis has just so beautifully shared that the Holy Spirit is a person. And he's a sensitive person. You know that? He, he's a very sensitive person. And so we can hurt him, but we can also bring him pleasure. And sadly, I think many Christians have very little understanding of the love language of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, what tends to happen is we're then not valuing the things that he values. And we're not getting the most from that relationship. Because true love requires sacrifice. It requires loyalty, and it requires valuing what they value. And this is how a friendship with God is developed and deepened, by understanding what our Heavenly Father is pleased by, what the Holy Spirit is pleased by, and beginning to live that way. Because, you know, friendship with God is something that we have no right to expect. We absolutely have no right to expect to be God's friends. It's a grace gift through Jesus Christ. Jesus has opened the way to a friendship to God. It's a great privilege. And the way we live, the way we respond to that, is either going to strengthen and deepen that relationship or weaken it. Does that make sense? And this is a real illustration of our relationship with God. We know that the Holy Spirit has a love language because the very verse that Mervis used, Ephesians 4 verse 30, says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And um, Mervis talked about the Greek word. And grief is such a powerful emotion, isn't it? You know, many of us have been through grief, and grief is an emotion that is so deep that it can have physical impacts on us. It can actually affect our well-being because we feel that emotion so deeply. And the the Greek word that Paul uses here, as Mervis was saying, it's an intense emotional pain, a deep sorrow that we can cause to the Holy Spirit. In fact, Mervis talked about the unfaithfulness. That was a new one on me. I didn't know, so I've learned something today. But it's also the Greek word that is used for the pain of childbirth. Now, I've heard that's quite painful. But it's an intense pain. So when Paul was warning here, he wasn't talking about the Holy Spirit being mildly upset. He was talking about us causing a deep hurt to the one who lives in us. And we're the temple for his presence. But not only can we hurt the Holy Spirit, but we can stifle him. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 19, Paul says to them, do not quench the Holy Spirit. And some translations say, do not stifle. So do not smother 
the work of the Holy Spirit. Do not actually um, push down and reduce the impact of what he's doing in your lives. And I think the, the meaning of these scriptures is so clear to us. It, it's telling us that we can damage our friendship. We can damage our friendship with the Holy Spirit. And we can restrict what he does in our lives. This is a, a picture I've got here, which uh, you'll have to go with me for a little bit. But imagine two ometers. You know what an ometer is? like a, a speedometer and a measureometer. So imagine you've got a presenceometer. Is that me? And you've got a, a usability-ometer, a presenceometer and a usability-ometer. And the Holy Spirit is never going to leave you if you've given your life to Christ. Because Paul said in that verse there, Ephesians 4.30, he's given as the seal of your redemption, as the promise of your eternal inheritance. So it, that word can mean deposit or guarantee or down payment. He's the gift that seals our eternal inheritance. You understand that? So he, he's not going to leave us because he, he's been given to us. However, we can strengthen or weaken how much he can do in our lives by how we treat that relationship. Our usefulness can be dependent on how we live. So as we respond, i.e. not grieving, then the strength of our relationship, the, the presence-ometer, goes more towards full. You understand that? Do you understand that? Yeah, I'm not confusing you here. And as the presence-ometer and the strength of his presence in our lives goes up, so our usability in the purposes of the kingdom goes up. The more we live to please him, the more usable we become in the kingdom. And the positive thing is that our ometers can not only go down as we grieve, but they can go up. We can bring pleasure to the Lord. In Acts 15, verse 28, you remember when um, the apostles were debating what rules or what guidance to give to the Gentile Christians. And Paul and Barnabas had gone up to Jerusalem to meet with the apostles there. They had the council to decide, and the Pharisees were saying, they need to fully comply with all the Jewish law. Circumcision and every aspect of the Jewish law. And, and Peter argued strongly, he said, well, we failed to live up to that. Why would we put that burden on the Gentiles? And James makes a decision. He says, well, we've heard all the debate, and they agreed on just a few guidelines which were agreed on to maintain a unity between the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians of avoiding food sacrificed to idols and meat with blood in it. You remember that? And that decision, it says, seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. That's what they put in the response. So that decision was a pleasing thing to the Holy Spirit. They sensed that they had brought pleasure to the Holy Spirit. And we see that because of that, what happened was the Gentile church just exploded. God's favor and blessing was on that because they had brought pleasure. It was good to the Holy Spirit. And you can read in Hebrews about others who brought pleasure to God, like Enoch. And then, wonderfully, there's that great picture of Jesus. When the Holy Spirit descends on Jesus in Luke 3, like a dove, it says he descended like a dove. And then the Father says, this is my Son, what? In whom I am well pleased. And then the Holy Spirit, having descended on Jesus like a dove, it says he remained on Jesus in all of fullness. So Jesus, his pleasure in terms of pleasing the Father, his ometer was so full that there wasn't one ounce of the Holy Spirit's presence that wasn't powerfully in him. The fullness of God dwelled in him, the full power because he was pleasing the Father and it remained on him. So for us, we the picture I want us to have is we can strengthen our relationship in terms of the usability and the power that God can use us for 
and we can also weaken it. Is that right? Good. So, quickly then, I'm going to cover two things this morning on what are the Holy Spirit's primary love languages. Well, the first one is it's a language of purity. Ephesians 4, 29 to 32. Maybe we can put that up. Let's read this together. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. So Paul here lists the things. It's, it's a very clear list of the things that can really hurt, that can really bring grief to the Holy Spirit. Bad language, the way we use our words, bitterness, rage, slander. And there's a nice catch-all there of all types of evil behavior. That includes being a Manchester United supporter. <laughs> <laughs> but his, his love language, the Holy Spirit's love language, is revealed and shown by kindness, compassion, forgiveness, when we are quick to forgive, and words that build up rather than tear down. And as Mervis was saying, why is that? It's because these are the character qualities that reflect our Lord. These are the character, character qualities that reflect the Lord. They reflect how the Holy Spirit, kindness and compassion. We're being changed to be more like Jesus. So the more we take these things into our lives and live for them, the more we look like Jesus. I was talking to, to Lucas recently. He's just got back from Paris. And uh, in Paris, they've got the Eiffel Tower. And the, the Eiffel Tower is lit up by 20,000 bulbs. 20,000 light bulbs light up the, the Eiffel Tower. So that amazing, beautiful structure, you can see it there, um, is lit up. And near and far, you can see the Eiffel Tower over Paris. 20,000 light bulbs illuminating the architecture of this incredible building and everyone in Paris can see it you know and all the tourists are drawn to it and that moment of it all being lit up it lights up once an hour it's totally evident everything about it and it looks so beautiful there doesn't it and you know that's what the Holy Spirit loves he loves anything that lights up Jesus if our, if our lives light up Jesus because they look like him, it's like the Eiffel Tower being lit up. And near and far, people can see, look, Chris is lighting up Jesus the way he lives. The kindness in his life and the compassion in his life, the way he worships, it's like 20,000 light bulbs on his life pointing to Jesus. And then basically anything that I do, that doesn't look like Jesus, takes it in the opposite direction. It reduces my ometers, my presence ometer, and my usability ometer starts to go in the opposite direction if I start to do stuff that doesn't look like Jesus. And I think sometimes we can fool ourselves a little bit because Paul says in Philippians 2.5, he says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And it doesn't say have 50% of the mindset of Jesus. It says have the same mindset of Jesus. And I think sometimes we think if it's not like the mindset of Jesus, it's still okay. So there's doing things that look like Jesus. There's doing very bad things. And there's doing things that are just neutral. Well, I want to tell you there isn't any neutral. Because as soon as we do things that don't look like Jesus, we risk putting ourselves in enmity to God. Anything else makes us an enemy of God. Listen to this. James 4 verse 4 says, You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? 
there for anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Oh my hat. That's what they say, isn't it? If I become a friend of the world, if I start to damage my witness, I'm putting myself as an enemy of God. It's not just that I'm out of his sight. Oh my goodness. You know, this was brought home to me so powerfully last year. I was due to go down to Cape Town, and so I came before the Lord because I, I hate going down to Cape Town um, unreconciled with God because I always get massively convicted and it spoils my time down there. So I came before the Lord and I said, Lord, search me. See if there is anything that is grieving you that is in my heart because I don't want to do that. I want to be totally in line with what you want me to be doing. And a weird thing happened because over 10 years ago, I mean, it's like maybe even 15 years ago, I was involved in the leadership team of a church that had a, a painful split. And over the years, I had been very confident that I had done everything that I was supposed to do and that none of the blame rested on me. In fact, I was so confident that I had like a little trophy in my cabinet not a real one. This is like a, you know, a pretend, an imaginary thing. And I used to get this trophy out and enjoy the bitterness and the unforgiveness and the, the self-pity of how badly I was hurt, give it a little polish, and then put it back in the trophy cabinet for another time. And then later, I maybe get it out again and I say, oh yeah, you know, I was really hurt there. And uh, I felt like the Lord said to me, you're grieving me because you're holding on to some hurt and some bitterness here. And I want you to deal with it. And even worse, and the way I want you to deal with it is I want you to take responsibility for even if it's the 1% of hurt that you caused in that process, I want you to apologize. I want you to ask forgiveness. Woo! <laughs> Such a small thing, really. But it was grieving and it was holding me back. And so what I did was I wrote a letter to every one of the um, leaders who were involved in that process and I didn't mention my hurt and my little trophy I just said please can you forgive me for the way I hurt you and for the things that I did there that didn't build unity and didn't uh, help us grow in the things of God even if I felt like maybe I wasn't responsible for a large amount of that and beautifully and graciously every one of them wrote back to me with great grace and uh, said, yeah, sure, we forgive you, and uh, we pray that you move on and, and do good things for the Lord. So that was a good moment. But, you know, even if they hadn't written back to me, as soon as I'd done that, I felt the presence of God flood my life. Because 1% of impurity is still impurity. If I said there was 1% sewage in this bottle of water, and I gave it to you and said, do you want to drink? None of you would drink that. And I, I, I think in terms of us building our relationship and going deep with God and deep with the Holy Spirit, I really believe there are things that many of us are holding on to. Maybe little hurts or little bits of bitterness or offense. And the Lord is wanting you today to let them go. Because the point is that that scripture says all types of evil, every type of evil, get rid of it. In Ezekiel, um, in that passage that talks about, I'll give you a heart of flesh or a tender heart rather than a stony heart, that prophecy said that they would get rid of every shred of idolatry in their lives. And then I'll put a new spirit into you. This is potential for us guys. This is potential and it's going to grow our usability with the Lord we're, so, we're very ready to think about murder and adultery and fraud. We see that as grieving the Holy Spirit, don't we? But then we forget that there are small things in our lives that can bring grief to him. And if we remove them, we're going to add to his pleasure in our lives. Maybe anger sometimes controls us at home. And, and we just need to bring that thing before him because it's by the Spirit that it's going to be dealt with. Or grumbling, maybe little grumbles have emerged in our lives where we become a little bit critical 
maybe critical of others in their lives or critical of leaders. And we just hold on to that little grudge like a little trophy cabinet and we, we bring it out of the trophy and we polish it up and then we put it back and continue with our lives. But these are the things that are going to really drive us forward if we can deal with them. These are small things, but I, I felt a couple of things which f- allow me just to maybe prophetically share them that I think the Lord wants to deal with today, really specifically. I, I've kind of described it as a, a creeping cynicism that stifles the Holy Spirit. You know, in that passage in 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 to 22, um, it says here, don't scoff at prophecy. Test everything that is said. Hold on to what is good and stay away from every kind of evil. And, and I just felt that perhaps sometimes we can get familiar. We get over familiar with the church. And it just allows us, we, we stop holding on to all that is good and our faith and our expectancy just starts to pull back a bit. And the faith that we have in what God can do is stifled by the fact that we're not holding on to all that is good. I, I know it's true of myself. You know, Carol and I had a conversation that sometimes you feel like, oh, I've been, I just go to church every week and not much is changing and I'm laying out my life. And, and then I really had to correct myself and say, rubbish! The Lord is wanting to do great things today. Just like he wanted to do great things yesterday. Just like he wants to do great things tomorrow. And I'm not going to allow a creeping familiarity to rob me of what God wants to do in the church. What he wants to do in your life and my life. Hold on to all that is good. And here's a specific word. You know, I really felt this, that some of us have allowed negative self-talk where we start to disqualify ourselves from things. We say, oh, I'm not very good at prophesying. Yeah, I, I really am not very good with a microphone. I, I can't articulate that. I can't sing. You can. <laughs> I'm never going to be able to be in leadership. Where I am today, God can't use me because I'm in such pain. But can I tell you what that is? That's harsh words. And what are harsh words? Evil. You're speaking evil over your life. And the Holy Spirit is grieved by the fact that you're speaking evil over your own life. We really easily recognize the fact that harsh words is me speaking something bad about someone else. We, we identify with that. But because it's us talking to ourselves, we feel like somehow we've got a right to hold on to it. it it's mine. It belongs to me. I'm going to polish that trophy because I'm never going to be a good singer. You know, I, I didn't... I mean, I'm not a great singer now, but I was carrying the fact that I was a bad singer from when I was at school and I was rejected from the school choir. We all had to line up and sing our hearts out, all things bright and beautiful. And the teacher walked along listening to each person. And I'm singing my heart out there and she walks past me and she keeps walking. (laughs) So I had to come before the Lord and I said, Lord, I want to be able to sing your praises without shame or embarrassment. I'm not going to allow that to hold me back. And I believe he's given me half a voice. And I want you guys to not hold yourselves back because it's evil. Get rid of all evil behavior and start to believe what the Holy Spirit can do in your life. Amen. And do you know what? Breaking free here, practically speaking, is so simple. It's not a complex process. We just come to the Lord in repentance. And what's his promise? Refreshing. Repentance, the word repentance has the same root word as the penthouse. So when we come in repentance, the Lord takes us back up to the penthouse, back up to the highest position. And you know what else it does? It glorifies Jesus. 
because the, Jesus died to give us grace that we can come to the cross, be forgiven, and be released. And then it lights up with 20,000 bulbs in our life. It's so wonderful. It's so wonderful. Don't hold on to my precious. Give it to the Lord. Give it to the Lord. And then as we do that, the lover of our soul comes in and such power and closeness. I'm sure all of you have come in some form of repentance and when you've received forgiveness, it's like the presenceometer shoots back up to the top of the scale. And we become usable again because we're not disabled by the things that we're carrying. And I believe today, church, that many of us are going to be set free today. Many of us are going to be set free from things perhaps long held or long spoken over us. And we're going to become usable in the kingdom. Amen? Because as we do this, we're actually strengthened in holiness. The sanctifying work of the Spirit, Paul calls it in 2 Thessalonians 2. We become stronger in holiness. And as our holiness grows, the fruits of the Spirit start to pop out in our lives. As we break free from these things, love, joy, peace, patience, faithfulness, goodness, kindness, self-control and gentleness, these beautiful fruits start to ping out in our life. And then, listen to this. 2 Timothy 2.21. If you keep yourself pure, you will be a special utensil for honorable use. Your life will be clean, and you will be ready for the master to use you for every good work. Isn't that beautiful? I, I put this down, and uh, I'm going to embarrass someone now. And I thought of Nikki Wood. Where's Nikki? You know... I didn't know Nikki um, many years ago, but I'm told she's a different person now. <laughs> and I think Nikki is an example of someone who we've seen get close in a relationship with the Lord. Someone who's pursued that purity in her life, that pleasing of God. And as she's done that, this verse has come true. You see her, Peter mentioned this to me last night. You see Nikki leading worship. I'm going to get most of them I just love our young people so much. <laughs> and do you know what they're doing? Some of them, they're speaking the love language of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And what's happening is they're becoming more and more usable in the kingdom. And Nikki's leading worship here today. She's going to be leading worship on a global scale very soon. Come on, guys. Let's all be Nikki Woods. No pressure, Nikki. <laughs> but there are others. You know, that's just an example because I think it's such a powerful example. Okay, so the last thing then is we've had the language of purity, the language of revelation. The Holy Spirit has a love language of revelation and I'm not going to develop all of this because Mervis covered some of it. You know, when Carol and I were in Iceland, is that photo? Yeah, here we are. We're in Iceland, trekking in Iceland. And can you see the, the wilderness ahead of us there? That is wild, volcanic landscape, freezing cold. In fact, we were told that um, some guys had died because they went walking in there with jeans on. And walking with denim is too risky because you just attract the cold. And they, they died of hypothermia. So um, that is life or death territory that we're about to trek in there. So why is my wife looking like she's on a Sunday afternoon stroll on the prom? She's got that lovely grin and she's totally happy and relaxed. Well, I'll tell you why. Because can you see the little guy with the shorts on? And the green hat. That's a guy called Brynagur. And Bryn is a guide. 
And he's trekked that land hundreds of times. He's an Icelander. He knows exactly how to guide a group of people through that land so that they have the most amazing experience. And we had the most incredible few days. We didn't see any darkness, not one minute of darkness. Beautiful landscape, and Bryn even taught us to sing. He cooked for us every night. We were following the guide. And the way we are going to get the Holy Spirit's love language deep in our life is we need to learn to listen intently to him, to develop that deep fellowship with him that is going to guide us into all that God has for us. You know, revelation, the word revelation means revealing or communicating of divine truth. Why would we not listen intently to the one who's guiding us into the things of God? Why would we not make his voice daily the thing that is going to be our first priority every morning? It's absolutely bonkers madness to do anything else. Because he is the one who's searching the things of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 to 13. These are the things God has revealed to us. How? By his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. He's the one who is going to help us understand what we've been given. He's the one who's going to lead us into the mysteries, into the deep things that he's searching in order to reveal them to us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. You know, the Holy Spirit's love language is marked by a deep interest in what he's saying an intense desire to explore what he's saying through the Word of God, through prophecy, through revelation, revelatory teaching like we've had over these last few days, or last couple of sessions. Because those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. We have to learn to include the Holy Spirit in all of our choices all of our decision-making, to readily go to him in even the small things that we're um, thinking about doing. And the desires here, the word desires, it's much more than an intellectual biblical understanding. It's a deep word that means um, emotional desires, emotional choices, strong desires, So we have to seek the strong desires of the Holy Spirit in what we're doing. And as we include him in our choices, we increase his pleasure in our life. Seeking him is loving him. Lamentations 3.25 says this, The Lord is good to those who depend on him, to those who search for him. The Lord is good to those who learn how to depend on him. And those who seek him and search him as he's the guide into all truth. So as we just come to the last bit here, how can I be more spirit-led? Get close to the guide. Live close to the guide. Mervis gave you some practical things this morning. Use his love language and cultivate a closeness to him. You know, the Holy Spirit never contradicts God's word. So if we're in his word daily, then he's guiding us. Read it like you and said until you have a revelation of what he's saying to you. Spend quality time with him face to face as a priority. And let me add one other thing. Listen to and spend time with those who know him well. I was once in India and uh, I was in a group of people and... um, One of the guys who was one of Gandhi's close aides was in that meeting, just talking. One who was a a strong personal friend of Gandhi. And the reverence that everyone else in that meeting had, hanging on his every word, 
because they knew this was a friend of Gandhi. This was someone who thought like Gandhi thought. And can I encourage you, spend time with people who spend time with God. Tune in to those who know the guide. Don't tune into the voices that are friends of the world. Tune into those that know the guide. Like in the Council of Jerusalem, they went to see James because they knew James had been with Jesus. And Peter, they knew this was a guy who'd lived with Jesus. So they wanted to hear what they had to say. And if we're full of the Holy Spirit, if we're living that way, can I say that your choices are going to be better? Those that are distracted and distant make poor choices. You see it time and time again. Those that are distant from the Lord and are distracted on other things, they make poor choices in their life. Those that are full of the Holy Spirit and being led by the Holy Spirit, they make better choices. Because sometimes it's not black and white. Sometimes we have to go with what seems good to us and to the Holy Spirit. And the best way we're going to do that is by being deeply in friendship with him. I remember someone telling me I had a really difficult decision to make as to whether to move our family abroad. And I said, Phil, what do we do? And he said to me, listen, God can't trust you, but he can trust the Holy Spirit in you. Allow the Holy Spirit to be the umpire, the peace in you about the decision you're making. So even if you haven't got black and white, Know the peace of God if you're full of the Holy Spirit. How do I know this? Well, listen to this, Colossians 3.15. And I'm reading from the Amplified here. Let the peace of Christ, the inner calm of one who walks daily with him, be the controlling factor in your hearts, deciding and settling questions that arise. To this peace indeed you are called as members in one body of believers and be thankful to God always. So how are you going to make good decisions? Be one who walks daily with him. And then the peace of God is going to flow with you. Perhaps, Nikki, you could come play. I, I want us to begin now to respond and to think of, about what God is highlighting in your life. Is there something, a 1% trophy, that you need to let go this morning? Is there a bit of unforgiveness or bitterness or something in your heart, harsh words that you're carrying around with you and you've tried to suppress it, you, but you know it's there in the trophy cabinet and every now and again it comes out and it gets polished. Or are you someone who's allowed negative self-talk to disqualify you? I want you to let it go today. Allow the friendship and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit to flood into you so that your presence ometer shoots up and then your usability in the kingdom goes up with it. Let's just close our eyes. Perhaps you'd like to stand with me. I was walking through Ramsey recently and uh, Leah and Carol were ha having a coffee and I took my little granddaughter, Edith, with me for this walk and we were walking, walking through the town and she was holding my hand, bless her. I had to reach down because she's so small. And she's holding my hand and she's pointing at things, showing me things, showing me the birds, playing in the puddle. As other people came up and said, she's so sweet. She's looking at me. She wants me to pick her up and carry her. And my love tank was overflowing with this little treasure of a girl. And then as we walked past the lifeboat shop, she wanted to go in, and inside the lifeboat shop, they had Billy Bear, this teddy bear. And she pointed at Billy, and I could see her little eyes light up. I had to buy it for her. <laughs> I could not resist buying that because she was giving me so much pleasure. And I want you to know, church, that if we please God, if we live this way, the Holy Spirit will be present to bring such great blessing. He's going to pour out on us. We're going to know close fellowship. Philippians 2, Paul talks about sharing common fellowship. He's going to release and trust gifts here today. 1 Corinthians 12, he releases gifts just as he determines. He sprinkles them lavishly, it says literally. 
and ministries are going to be opened up. And we're going to be so full of him that rivers of living water are going to bubble up out of us and flow out. Not a harsh little reservoir, but rivers of living water. 